So we're going to start modeling, basically. Uh, we're going to uh, have a look at how you can correctly set up uh, reference images. Um, I'm not going to be using necessarily orthographic images. So last time we looked at what are the differences between orthographic cameras and perspective cameras. So when I say orthographic uh, images, that means very, uh, very well-defined uh, reference images that lack dimension, right? Like blueprints. So often, if you're modeling a very specific car or very something that has a very specific design, it's very common to use orthographic images, right? So you would have a side view and a front view and a, even a top view, and then you'd keep modeling. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that's fine. But you can also use uh, reference images that are not necessarily orthographic. Just find any image. And that's sort of what I want you to uh, be able to do. So take any image and also more conceptually be able to just model something without necessarily having 100% accurate measures for everything. Uh, what's this? Keep. All right. Yeah, so basically then we're going to, uh, as we model, we're going to experience that sometimes uh, there are some strange things happening to the mesh, to the model, and then we're going to have to be able to uh, spot the errors and, and fix the errors, basically. So you, it's all about making you more comfortable as you work. You're spotting errors. You know what to do. Uh, Okay, so then we're going to uh, start with model modeling tools. So basically, we're going to talk about mainly uh, insert edge loop tool and extrude. So those are the, I think, the two you know main tools when it comes to polygonal modeling. And yeah, so today uh, we will only be doing hard edged assets, so not really subdividing too much. That will be next time. Uh, because this will require enough attention, I think. Uh, so, anyways, uh, blah, blah, blah. So, the lab assignment that I want you to do is that you're going to do a simple kitchen set. You know, this is a very standard sort of intro uh, kind of thing. You do a kitchen. It's just because in a kitchen we'll, we find, you know, different uh, sorts of models, you know, the various challenges. Also, some subdivided round uh, assets, but also hard-edged assets. So basically, I think, uh, so what I would want you to do until next time is really see if you can't model uh, a kitchen, but, but you don't have to start modeling any of the rounded off or subdivided objects, only the hard-edged ones. So just a simple chair, simple table, simple countertop, simple, just keep it simple. Uh, all right. So what, I, what I'll have time uh, to do here to show you is I'm going to basically just model a very simple chair. And then we're going to use that chair and also create the uh, table. So, all right. All right. And I'm still on my 2015 here. So this is, I know there's 2016 on the labs. So but that, you should be fine uh, with that for now. So it's not ideal, but this com computer is still on the old old image, so it will be updated at one point. And preferably, you should be on the server, but all right, well, you're you're not. Okay. What's great about uh, you storing the thing on the server is that we can access it anywhere. So if you, know, if you had some questions, I could pull it up and we could have a look at your file, but. for later. All right, so let's just search for, you know, kitchen chair. So maybe I'll find some examples of orthographic, you know, just to show you. Maybe there are some ortho orthographic ones. See, these are orthographic reference images. You know, they're great if you have very precise measurements. So if you're doing a very specific model, from Ikea or whatever, you know, fine. All right. If you're doing something a little bit more conceptual, and like I said, what I want you to also be able to do is take something like this, you know, and just, you know, you improvise a little bit. So 
Uh, okay, so I'm just going to find one. So, like I said, I encourage you to find something simple. Uh, just try really try to stay away from any too complex shapes because I want you to be able to do this and do this well. Uh, first of all, so not a very high resolution resolution image, but that's fine. So, yeah, store this. Uh, where did I? Uh, okay. All right, so again, so this is the project file from last time. So let me make, go in Maya and we'll make another project window. So we'll go down to project window and we're going to make a new project. So this will be 16906. What was my, what? So, you know, I'm creating my own little um, naming convention here for these project files. So I'm going to call this CGR1 lecture tube. And I need to tell uh, Maya where that uh, project should exist. So again, I need to find the WinGyber. You can map the network drive. You know how to do that, like, or maybe not. <laughs> uh, sometimes that actually can cause some issues uh, when we're rendering and things like that. So the best or the safe thing to do is just to write this, but you, you know, you don't have access to this yet. And I just need to find that path. So this is the path in which the project should exist, right? So I'm just finding the root path, select, and this is what it's going to be named. And these are all the files I'm going to get within that project file. Except, so Maya should be creating that right here. So you see this is now showing up in the finder. Lecture queue. All right. So, yeah, let's get going. So there's a couple of ways to set up reference images. Um, if I hit spacebar and we look at all the panels, there is actually uh, an image plane option. It's, yeah, it's fine. For, for my purposes right now, I'm just going to set up a very simple... Uh, I have one image. I'm just going to attach it to a plane, and then I'm going to hide it in a display layer. So if I just make a plane, oh, and I'm going to. So and also because of the IT <laughs> uh, problems right now, it seems like the use my user preferences are not following me each time I open Maya. But usually it, it it would. But now it's like Maya has done a reset, so I would have to go in and do all these options again. So usually, remember last time I unchecked interactive creation. That would mean that this time it should also be unchecked, but for some reason now it resets every time. But has to do with all these issues we're having. Okay, uh, so the so plane. So when I create that plane, it has a lot of divisions. I don't really need that. So I can go into the channel box and I can say, no, don't. I don't really need divisions. You know, just just a plane. Okay. So now um, today we're gonna. We're going to be very specific about the scale of things, but right now, uh, let me just quickly assign uh, material. So how many here did have a chance to go through the hypershade and everything on the lab with the TA? How many did not? How many have never opened hypershade? So there are some of you. All right. So we'll do an explanation uh, quickly. <laughs> Let's take like five minutes and just talk about this. So under Window Rendering Editor's Hypershade, there's this. So this is where you have access to the materials. So currently, the reason why this uh, polygonal plane is displayed gray is because it has a material assigned to it. And that material is just a Lambert one. So a Lambert is just a type of material that's in Maya, it's been here forever. It's kind of a lam Lambertian type reflection. So it looks almost like rubber or something. You know, there's it's not a lot of specular values. Another one is Blinn. You see the difference. This has more of a, it's, it's more reflective. It seems more specular. So we're going to get back to this. 
but essentially, the uh, point being, if I double click Lambert 1 and I alter the color, now all the objects that I create will be that color because they all have that default Lambert 1. That's all that means. And I can create a new blend, middle mouse button click and drag, and I can drop this material onto objects. So you see the difference. They have more of a highlight, what we call a specular reflection, because the blend has specular shading. Okay, so back again, back to the Lambert one. I can just make this gray again. So I encourage you not to change Lambert one, because that's just the default material that all the new objects you create will have. So just leave that at its default setting. Okay, <laughs> so you know. Uh, you just have to try this. Uh, oh, you know, if you double click, like we were saying last time, the attribute editor will show all attributes for any anything you select. So if you select the material, it will show up in the attribute editor. Then you can change the color. You can set, you know, transparency. So then it becomes transparent. Uh, ambient color, you know, uh, incandescence. This is like self illumination. We'll get back to this. Bump mapping, diffuse, all this. Uh, all right. But you see, Lambert, unlike uh, the blend, does not have anything called specular. If you double click the blend, there's specular shading. Right. <laughs> so we're going to get back to this. We're also going to look at some more advanced materials, like physically based materials. But the blend and the Lambert, you know, they're great for just look dubbing. And while we're working, they're very fast, uh, you know, to see update in Maya. Right. So now I'm going to make another shader. We have one down here called the surface shader. That's actually a very simple shader. It has, you see, it has almost nothing. It's just because it actually doesn't calculate much. It's, it's just a, an image, really. So I just apply this, middle mouse button click and drag. And you see it's just black. That's just because this is the out color that's displaying. So regardless of the lighting in your scene, regardless of anything, this will just display the image. That is a very, very, very simple type of material, surface shader. So I can also actually create materials without going to the uh, um, hypershade. I can just right click and hold and go down here. So there's assign favorite material, assign existing material. These are all the ones that are already created in, in the Hypershade, or new material, or material attributes that will also open the material over here. So if I'm working, you know, da, 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 I just want to see this material, I go right click and I go to material attributes and that will open it here. All right, so material attributes. So this is where we're, I'm obviously going to connect the image, my reference image which is this one. So I'm just going to put that. So we already did the project directory. Now I'm just going to put this directly into source images. Or actually, I'm going to put it in images for now. So let me just ref chair. So we can just look at it. So you see Maya creates all these paths, but I, I just put it in here in images. Reference chair. Let's, let's just have a look at it. So I'm just going to open that in uh, Photoshop. The main thing here is just I want to make sure that this is a one to one image. Let's just make things easier. So the pixels, yeah, it's 550 times 550 pixels. So it's the aspect ratio is one to one. So let's say it wasn't. Let's say you had a rectangular image or something. Just a very quick and very easy way is that you just make a new document and you make sure you're working in a one to one image. So, you know, standard image resolution. So we'll get back to this as well. It's just doubling up from 2, so 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, 2048, 4096. So 1024, 
typically we want to stick to these numbers, just doubling up from two, uh, just for efficient data handling, processing. So very common, 1024, 2048, 4096, 1K, 2K, 4K. So you'll hear us talking about this all over and over again. So typically we want to try to see if we can't stick to these values. So I'm just going to make a 1K. I'm not, I wouldn't necessarily have to do this here. I'm just saying if this weren't a one-to-one -one image, this is a very quick, quick and easy way. You know, just select this one, control A to select all, control A, control C to copy, and control E, and you paste it in there. And now we have this in a one-to-one -one image. Now it's not very, it's not high res, so it could maybe 512 by 512, you know, half of 1K would have been okay here, right? Just quick and easy. What you don't want to do is, you know, start scaling this. Obviously, you can adjust the canvas and all that, but this is very easy. Make a new document, make it one-to-one, -one, drop the thing in there, and you're good. But in this case, I didn't have to do that, so that's good. So that means I can just actually put it directly in the source image. So the source image directory is where Maya is looking for any file, any image file that's going into a material. It should be in the source images directory. In images, typically you, when we start rendering, when we get images out of Maya, they will end up in images. You can also put your own images in there. But here is really where you should put anything that goes directly into a material. So this is reference shares is a JPEG. Let's try it. So I go back to Maya. So, okay, so now I'm in the attribute editor. I'm in the surface shader. And whenever you see these little icons, looks like a checkerboard, that's where you can attach something. So I'm just gonna click this. And it brings up all these nodes. So a lot of these are procedural nodes, you know, they're computer-generated uh, fractals and things that uses uh, math to just generate texture patterns, right? And that's actually very powerful, but uh, for the most part, uh, you know, we're going to be using file textures. So this is the file node. It just means that you have an incoming image file, so there, this is the file node. So this might seem a little, maybe a little confusing at first because you have to navigate through all these nodes. But let's open up uh, the hypershade again. So currently, let's. This is the surface shader that I just created. It's attached to this object. If I wonder where is this material, I can right click and I can say select objects with material. That's going to select the object. So I can, okay, it is attached there. That's fine. And then if I want to see any in, incoming nodes, so I just made a file node. I'm looking at it here. Or no, I'm not. I'm looking at it here. <laughs> this is the file node. To see that, I just click the material, and I go to this button, which is input connections. That will show me all the input connections down here in the work area. So this is the file node that we just created. This is the place to the texture node, so we're going to get back to this. So you, for now, you don't have to worry about it, but you just see it. You know, this this controls the file node, and the file node, which currently doesn't have an image, goes into color, All right? But there's nothing in it, so we just select it, and then it should appear here in the attribute editor because anything you select will show up in the attribute editor. But you can also navigate like this. So these little arrows over here, you see I can toggle, I can go between nodes. So here I'm in the place 2D texture node, here I'm in the file node, I'm in the material. All right. Basically, you want to navigate to the file node. And then image name, then we're going to find the image. So when I click here, Maya is going to look for it in source images. So that's the correct path for this to function optimally right so I'm just selecting this open and now this is connected via the file node into the material there's a filter type on all these file nodes it's basically to prevent flickering and things like that in animation what it is is basically just blurring your image a little bit so I just turn that out I don't need it okay and it seems like nothing happened so that's depressing but we have to press number six. 
All right, so last time we pressed number four and five to toggle between wireframe and shaded mode. So in shaded mode, you can't really see any textures. So press six, so four, five, six, and I can toggle between those. So it worked. And just because we're going to get back to UVs and everything, so we're not going to talk about that now. But if you just create a plane, it already has UVs. Perfect. Just apply surface shader, apply the image. OK, so far so good. So then don't have to worry about this. And we, we did something. I'm going to save this. So. I forgot my convention here, but whatever. Lecture two. Oh, one. All right. So then let's spend a few minutes talking about how to set up the scale properly. So let's get rid of that sphere. I don't need that. Now let me just rotate this. The first thing is to orient this correctly. So if we take a look down here, Again, the axis indicator. Let me change the background. You see the axis indicator down there? So the Z axis, the blue axis, should always be pointing forward. So in other words, the, the front of the chair should be pointing with the Z axis. That's very important. So, you know, Y axis is obviously going up and down. X axis is always the width. So that uh, red axis is always the width. And the Z axis is always the depth. This is important when you want uh, your model to be optimized also for other softwares that we're going to be using. OK, so let me just rotate this uh, 90 degrees around the X. And there it is. So I have no idea about the scale of this. I could do a quick search. It's just like, you know, average kitchen chair. Height. Maybe I'll find an image. Yes. Right? So, what's this? 50, 60, 70, 80. You know, so I'm going to say like, you know, maybe 110, 115 centimeters, 120 to the top. Right? Okay. Just gives me the ballpark, right, over the chair. Fine. So, a quick and easy way to do this is actually to create a measuring cube. I mean, that's what I like to do. So, because if I go down to pol polygon primitives, I go to the cube, but I can go to the options for it. So, and here I just enter the values. So we were saying these are this is centimeters, right? So we were saying oh maybe 115 centimeters in the height. Fine, 115 centimeters. And you know you could do the same for the other dimensions. So maybe we have to guesstimate this. It doesn't give us any exact one, but 50. So I'm, I'm going to say like, you know, maybe 40, 45, 40 centimeters. Just going to try it. If it looks wrong, you know, whatever. 40 for the width and the depth. So create. So we have to imagine that. So it doesn't look to write to me, so I'm just gonna, you know, maybe maybe the chair would exist within this volume. You know, this is what you have to sort of guesstimate. All right, fine. You can change it later, but now it's at least correct. Okay, so uh, let's let's place this also on the grid. So I'm just gonna hold D, hold V. I'm gonna snap this down to the bottom birds. And I'm gonna go to the front view. I'm gonna hold X. I'm gonna snap this down to the grid. So now this is exists on that grid. The grid is tiny. That's uh, annoying. So we just go up here, display grid options. And we can add a zero there. So at least it will give me some more units. So I'm going to add just a zero to the length and width and just to both of these values if you want. And we have a larger grid. So now things make sense. So leave it to centimeter. You, know, you can do a measuring cube. You can scale up the grid. One other thing you're going to experience, uh, and I'm not experiencing now, I think, because somehow this, uh, what I think you'll find, oh, it's 
you know, all right. So you see at some point this is cutting off. So I'm over here and I'm going away, 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 and there it's gone. That's the clipping plane of the camera. So what will happen probably when you're working uh, is that you'll find it strange. Like when you make things very large in Maya, not very large, but much larger than the original one centimeter cube. What you're going to have to do, probably, is to go into your camera. So I can view select camera. That selects the current perspective camera. There's something called clipping planes. So this sounds very technical, but you know, you just have to go in here and do it. <laughs> if you experience flickering, you know, then because our scene is now larger, you have to increase the clip planes. So the near clip plane is set to 0 0.1. You might try setting that to 1. And then just adding maybe a 0 or even 2 to the far clip plane for the perspective camera and even for the orthographic cameras. So if I go very close, right now you can see at some point the polygonal object will clip. That's the near clipping point. So if you, if you find that you're going to be working a lot in here and you think this is annoying, then you have to go in here and you have to lower the near clip plane. So 0 0.1, right? So th that's the clip planes. Typically, if we're working here, increase it a little bit. That's the one thing you have to do. Yeah, question? OK. Um, I don't know. Would be nice, right? You know, it just it has to clip at some point, I guess. You know, it's a good question. I don't know. Should it would be nice, but you know, we we have to deal with these clipping planes. You know, I don't know why. Um, yeah, yeah, but it is you know the performance thing. Um, yeah. Okay, so we did something else. Uh, let's save it. So we're gonna we're gonna do an incremental save. So this we're gonna do zero two. Okay. So one thing we can do we're gonna make a display layer. Now we have this wonderful measuring cube. I'm gonna hit Control A. So these are the display layers, and I'm gonna say put this one, create a new layer, and assign selected object. And then I can make it a template. So now it's there. I can't select it. It's just there, and we have a nice little measuring cube. And I can size this to fit. Now I'm in the front view. You know, this is not very exact. You know, I'm just like guesstimating. I'm just going to leave it over here. Even I'm not really going to. This is just instead of having this image somewhere, so I have to keep going in and out of Maya for my sake. I'm just going to leave it there, and you know, leave it at wherever you want. If you find that it's annoying, you can also make a display layer for it. So this would be the reference. And we could even reference it. So remember this one. Now we can't select it, but it's there. So it's a very nice way to do it. So And this would be the measure. Whatever. Measurement, measurement, measure. OK. Cool. Any other questions? So that little bit is just like, you know, you select objects and you can hit this button. You can create new display layers. And then by clicking here, you can shuffle between making them, you know, this is just visible. So that means no effect. This is a template, which means it just shows the outline. And once again, this is a reference. So it's there, but you can't select it. All right. Let's just start modeling, and then we'll take a break. Uh, but we'll just start with something. So obviously, then uh, the orthographic images becomes still very useful to tell the scale. So I, you know, I can be working as much as I want over here in the perspective view, but then I want to go to the front view to really make sure I'm, you know, I'm making this decisions on the scale and the proportions. So let's just start with something. So 
uh, whenever you're modeling, like we were, we mentioned last time, it's worthwhile taking just a little time to analyze what you're doing. So think about how many objects this chair would have been made of in reality. Like how would it actually be constructed? You know, sometimes you, you have very sophisticated carving and, and shapes and things might be carved out of one solid piece of wood. This chair is not. And rarely do you have furniture that are made that way. Usually you have to find where where are the seams, which are the pieces. So here it's very simple. You know, this leg is definitely separate. So you have one, two, these are one, so one, two, three, four legs. These are separate pieces. These are separate pieces underneath. You know, it's not rocket science. We can, we can we can tell, and we might as well construct it that way in 3D. So what I don't want you to do is just to start out modeling this in one mesh. Like you know, it's unnecessarily complicated, and it doesn't make for a better better model. It's actually better to construct it the way it would be in reality. When you're constructing things from one mesh, things get complicated, which we will experience because sometimes, obviously, we have to do that. Very often, when we're creating models that are more complex in their shapes, we have to create single mesh solutions. But very often, if you can get away with it, I would recommend multi-mesh uh, solutions. So then it just becomes a series of little tasks, you know, very simple. So we can just start by creating. So now I'm going to just tackle this front leg. Oh, so if you ever see me doing this, right, you can toggle between full screen and seeing the UI. It's just control space bar. Control space bar, which is very handy. So, you know, it's going to get this in the ballpark. So instead of necessarily snapping this object to the grid, I can grab these verts and I can hold X and I can snap these verts to the grid. So now I'm just manipulating the vertices. I'm holding control to scale all the axes at once except the axis I'm holding. The other two. So if I'm observing this simultaneously also in the perspective view, you see what happens. Right? So it seems like it's thinner at the bottom. So I'm just going to grab the bottom verts and I'm going to, again, I can just hold control, scale those in. I'm creating that shape. So in this case, it becomes really necessary for me to scale the vertices. I'm scaling the vertices towards each other. That's how I'm achieving this shape. OK. And I'm just going to make um, just gonna grab these words. Just uh, oh, maybe we'll center the pivot. And again, I wish I had my shell from last time, but it will take you two seconds to set it up, so I recommend you do. Okay, just to give me an idea of where, where that seat might be. So uh, cool. I'm going to center the pivot. I'm going to freeze the transformations. Where are you? Anyway. Let's uh, look at this. Okay, beautiful. So, I mean, there's a lot of things uh, off with this. It looks uh, fake. <laughs> what? What's the main thing? Uh, if I don't know. I don't, I don't know if you can see what I'm thinking about, but there's something very specific that's kind of off with this model. Does anyone have any idea? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Obviously, the the placement of it is wrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. <laughs> I will, I will, I will get it in the right place eventually. 
What else is wrong with it, though? I mean, it's gray and dull, and it's inside a CG world, but if we can try to pinpoint something with the model that's lacking. Yeah. It, it's also, maybe, you know, this is pretty straight. But yeah, but you would insert some variations. Okay. All right. So let's, uh, for the sake of argument, just do that. Um, you know, I think it might be quite straight this in this case, but often you can insert some uh, variations. So we're going to talk about this tool. You know, if you wanted to, you know, do more of a, I could insert some more edge loops to keep adding and make variations or even like skew it off if I were to do more of a bad, you know, old chair. But okay, cool. But I, I want this to be quite straight though. So I'm thinking about something else. Bevel. Who said bevel? Exactly. So what's bevel? Round the corners. Right. So um these edges are actually physically impossible. So in Maya, we have these racer sharp edges that have no volume. You know, it just, they just meet in this point, which is just a mathematically constructed edge, but it will never happen in reality because usually when you have an edge of sorts, it will actually have some volume. There will be something there. And if you take a look around you, like if you look at the table next to you, Actually, the edges usually will catch light. So it's almost like there's a streak of light going through the edges. So that's a stark difference here because it's just like a very harsh transition between this lighter side of the mesh to the darker side of the mesh. So we need to have volume on the corners. That's basically what, what we were talking about. So a way of doing that in CG, we can just do something called a bevel. So let me just isolate this object. So if, whenever you're working, if you really just want to look at the object you're working on, you can hit Shift I. So that means isolate. So everything else is still here. It's just currently this is being isolated. If you want to get everything back, you have to select nothing and hit Shift I. So that means isolate nothing, show everything, or Shift I, anything you select. OK. So edit mesh uh, edge bevel. There we have the operation we have to use. So you can do this operation on a select, uh, a selection of bevels. If you do it in object mode, it will just bevel all the edges in the object. So in this object, we can actually do it in object mode because all the edges, if we analyze it, they're actually the contour edges. All the edges are uh, on the corners. Okay. Let's try it. But before I do that, I'm going to make a copy of this just because I have it. So usually when I work, I look at this sort of as my work shed. So you know, I'm not worried about you know copying things over. You know, for for the sake of my own, uh, it's very practical. It's very easy to go back and try things. I have it right there. I don't have to open another scene or anything. All right. So let's try it. So edit mesh uh, edge bevel. So that's what it'll do. So you see, wherever there were edges, there are now faces. So we just get more faces. So we add to the poly count. We add more polys, but we do get a nicer transition. So one thing we're going to do is we're going to go down here in the channel box. So if you remember last time, we said anything we do anything to the mesh, it will actually show up under the inputs. So if we just select this operation, you see this is the current bevel operation. That's still here. We can do things to it. So um, the fraction, I believe, it used to be the offset, but now I think it's the fraction. The way uh, these channels work is that you can actually just click them, and then you can use the middle mouse button out here and drag, and you can use it as a slider. So that's just Maya likes to not make things too intuitive. <laughs> so you, have to, you have to know about it. But if you just select it and use the middle mouse button, you can, uh, you can use a slider. Uh, you can also enter numerically. So if I wanted an even slighter bevel, you know, I can go no 0 0.05. No. So 
So there's one little issue with this though. It's uh, totally fine, but you do get these little tries at the corners. So we're gonna this is we're gonna come back to this over and over again, but for the sake of it's just better when you're working to really try to uh, stay clear of tries. I mean, it doesn't really matter for your mesh too much. You know, everything uh, is actually tries anyways. But when we're working, we want to make sure everything is quads. So we're going to be talking more about this after the break. But a, just for now, a quick and easy way to actually not have a solution with tries is to go into the bevel operation. So where it's a segment, you can actually insert two. So that will insert, in effect, an edge loop just smack in the middle of that bevel operation. So then if we analyze, we go in here and have a look. So I'm pressing F, F whenever you want to frame something. So I'm F, that will frame it. So you see, these are actually quads. So one, two, three, four edges on all of these little quads. Plus, we get a nice rounded off uh, solution there. So that's an all quad solution. You know, yes, we're adding uh, to the poly count. So this is also something you'll get more and more used to if you're doing, especially if you're doing in-game assets. Uh, we're not uh, if for those of you who want to be modeling more. This is uh, becomes a concern because you you could bake this down into a normal map and so forth. But for the most part, especially for a film or any project you're doing, really, we're just bevel things, and we always, 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 always have to have bevel edges, whether that means it's baked in the normal map or whether whatever. It just means that visually, you see a, the transition right now is just so much better if we compare it to this. You see. Uh, light is actually catching that edge. There seems to be volume there. So this looks just fake. This looks better. All right. Yeah. So that's beveling. Beautiful. All right. So let's take a short break and uh, no, no. Let's keep going. We'll keep going for like ten minutes. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, and yeah. So I'll keep that over there. Okay, happy, happy with that one. I'm gonna save a new scene. So I'm just saving binaries. I, I guess I could save with ASCII, but it's fine. All right, so uh, you know I can still alter the vertices. I can scale them towards each other, but really, uh, you you want to make sure that you try to do your modeling over here. It's just much easier and it's more elegant because if you start doing a lot of changes after you bevel. Chances are you'll you'll start introducing some irregularities to the bevel, so it's no longer such a nice operation. But the bevel itself, as you saw, is very quick, and I can also go into the bevel and set it to be two segments. You know, I can set some of these settings in advance. You know. All right. So Shift I, everything will come back. So we're going to use the top view. So I'm pressing F, just going between. So I can't see anything because this one is covering my view when I'm looking from above. So I have to press 4 and can go to the wireframe mode. And I can start placing this where I want it to be. So this is the front left leg, or right leg, depending. Um, all right, so maybe, you know, maybe there. Oh, cool. All right, so now we're going to create this little piece. I'm just going to copy this one and make it. Done. So I'm using the front view, which is brilliant at doing these uh, measurements and relationship uh, uh, relation between different objects. So one little thing, uh, again, workflow-wise, like if you're scaling like this, you, you'll notice sometimes that it's hard it's hard to be accurate. Well, what you can do, you see, see when, I, when I start scaling, that one axis is still active, like it's it's yellow. That means I can hold, again, I can hold middle mouse button and scale. 
And I'm actually, that's a little bit more accurate. I could also enter it numerically if you want it to be ridiculously accurate. You know. Side view, put it in place. Okay, so what do we have to do to this thing? Level. So I'm gonna I'm gonna freeze the transformations so it's zero all these settings out. So because it's where I want it, I'm gonna make a copy of it. You know what the hell? It's over there. And I'll bevel. And I already set it to two segments, so it's doing the two segment thing. But I just go in here and I make the fraction lower, 0 0.1 or 0 0.05. Sometimes you can be very subtle with that bevel. It's just really so when you're uh, in an animation or when you're walking around, it will be very apparent if some if it's not there. So that's something that goes for a lot of what we're doing. So that sometimes you say, well, there's no difference. Well, really, you'd you'd notice if it if it weren't there. Okay, that's a lot of times the case with a lot of what we're doing. Okay, good. So it's done. I'm going to delete the history. I'm going to freeze the transformations. Fine. That little piece is done. So now we need to get this guy over to the next side. How do we do that? Any suggestions? Yeah, if I want this one just over here. <laughs> uh, what do we do? Yeah, we copy paste in a sense. Two. Yep. So how do we so to duplicate in Maya just hit control D, you can duplicate anything. So uh, I'm gonna duplicate it. Now it's duplicated. Then I'm gonna change the pivot. I'm gonna put the pivot. I'm going to hold D, I'm going to hold X, I'm going to snap to the middle grid line. So I'm holding D, right? So I'm, I'm grabbing the X axis. When I'm grabbing the X axis and at the same time holding X, which means snap to grid, it's going to look for points along the grid, along the X axis. So I can leave it, I can just hover the mouse over the middle grid line. And that's going to leave it there. And since I froze the transformations, this is nice and tidy. So I can just go here to scale X, and I can go minus 1. Then I'm going to freeze the transformations. And it's done. So it used to be that we'd have to be very uh, observant when doing this, because it would flip the normals. But it seems like Maya now uh, just does it automatically. Uh, but there is actually a, a front side and a back side to all the polygonal objects. Um, so we're going to get back to this as well. But if I create a plane, it becomes very apparent. So, you know. If I take a look at the back side of the polygon, you see it's black. That's what we don't want to see. So we, we don't want to see the back faces, ever. Especially in game engines, you know, if you have models that are slightly revealing the back faces, you'll see that they become invisible. It looks very strange. Um, so we don't want to see the back faces. And also if we look at this guy, if we, if we venture inside here, we're traveling, we're going inside, it's black in here. So that an important setting here under lighting is you don't want the two-sided lighting to be on. So if we turn on two-sided lighting, it will not display black. It's going to show the back faces just like that. So under lighting, just make sure you turn off two-sided lighting. And that's a nice quick way just to see that's the back faces. So what I was saying here is that used to be the case where we, whenever we scale in negative value, values, right? Typically, we don't really want to do that because we're inverting things. 
But it seems like Maya now just does it automatically. But it used to be the case that we'd have to go and actually reverse the normal. So we'll talk about this later. Uh, get back to normals. But every little polygon has a normal. We can actually display them. So display polygons uh, face normals. Those are the normal. That's just the way that polygon is facing. So if I select a, a polygon, I can go and I can flip it. So I say reverse that normal. Now that one's reversed. This is something you would never do, <laughs> but it just um, you need to know what's happening. So if you see this, it means that oh no, the normals are strange. They're not. They're not nice. So then we have these tools up here. You know, we can uh, do things. So if you saw this, you'd say, oh no, this is wrong. Uh, let me. Hello. Uh, there's also conform, which is like, okay, the majority decides, you know, you conform the ones who are incorrect to the majority. So it's a very helpful tool. So these normals are incorrect. I just conform. Boom. All right. So let's get, we'll talk more about that. But that's basically normals. Uh, okay. But everything, all you have to, Think about when you're uh, mirroring, just make sure you freeze the transformations. Here should be good. All right, so let's take uh, like a 15 minute break. So we're going to start talking about some of the modeling tools. So, so far, we really only uh, uh, adjusted the primitives and we've done bevels in object mode. And we had a brief look at the uh, insert edge loop tools. So let's let's just look at it one more. Insert edge loop tool. I'm unsure where you find it in 2016. You have to spend time to find it. Insert edge loop tool. When you have it, uh, you want to make sure you're in uh, object mode. So the way it works is that you select or you click on the edges. So if I click along this edge, you can see there it will create a brand new edge loop running all the way around the object. Similarly, this way, like it will intersect these edges running all the way around the object. So it just creates a nice coherent mesh. The way it works is that it, it's looking for quads. So when it can't find quads along the path, it will not work. So let's say, let's just create a scenario here where it wouldn't work. Uh, let's look at another tool, Let's uh, the cut faces tool, which is similar uh, I guess now it's called multi-cut tool and it might have changed name again. don't know. Essentially, you need to find this. I'm going to add it here. So there's the insert edge loop tool and there's the multi-cut tool. Which used to work better, but now it's okay. So I hover over the vertices. You see, it starts flickering. And if I just click here, I can actually create an edge going across here. And then hit enter. So then I go, like a nice uh, habit when you're exiting the tools is just to press Q. Q is to select selection tool, right? So Q, W, E, R. So whenever I'm in a tool and I want to exit, you want to make sure that it, you're not really using the tool again, just press press Q and then go to object mode and I'm out of that operation. So with the multi-cut tool you can see yeah, you can create your edges whenever you, wherever you want. With the insert edge loop tool it will encompass the entire mesh as long as it finds only quads. But now I intentionally created two tries so we no longer have an all quad solution. So like we were saying earlier when we're modeling, we're going to try for the most part to see if we can stick to quads. It just makes life easier. But let's try the insert edge loop tool now around this path. You can see that 
it's actually going to stop right there. So it's not going to it's not going to continue across the tries. So whenever you're using the insert edge loop tool, for some reason, if it's not encompassing your mesh, it could be that there's a try, or it could be that uh, let's actually let's uh, let's try something else. Okay, so that's the one thing that can happen. It needs to find quads. Let's get rid of this again. Backspace to delete one edge like that. Uh, one thing you should be aware of: if I if I double click this, I'm selecting the entire edge loop, right? So double clicking will select the edge loop. If I just hit backspace to delete it, and I go to vertex mode, you can see that it leaves behind all these vertices. If I go to wireframe mode, so you need to be careful with that. So this is no longer technically an all quad solution. You have these weird polys. This will actually create two edges here, all along. So all these are now what we call n-gons because they have more than four sides more than four edges. So you never you never want that. This edge has like now one, two, three, four, five, six edges or this face. So that's just because you're telling Maya to only delete those edges. If you wanted to delete the edges and the vertices, there's a quick way to just control backspace. And then they're gone. I mean, it would it would also be as simple as you could. Hang on, get rid of those. Oh, okay, so if you have these leftover vertices, you can just select them and delete them. But so that's one thing to be aware of when you're deleting edges. So now we're gonna I'm gonna do something, and we're not gonna be exploring this feature, but we're gonna be doing that next time. But I'm gonna hit the number three to subdivide this mesh. Subdividing is just creating this smooth curvature based on this polygonal primitive. So in Maya we can toggle between just click one and three. There's also number two which will show you the poly cage, like the polygon around the curvature. So we're going to talk about this in more detail next time, like how can we make that curvature behave the way we want. But right now, if you try this, just press number three, you can see that, well, it's creating a very coherent, predictable curvature. You know, it seems it seems to be working. Okay. That's because all the vertices are connected. So now we're going to open up, we're going to go to the display, uh, heads up display. I'm going to open up the poly count. This will just display up here. It's going to show me that if I select this object, you can see that it has a total of 24 faces. This number is the total. Like if I hit Shift I, we know that there's more stuff in my scene, so don't worry about that. But we're only caring about this. So Shift I, 24 total faces, 48 edges, all these numbers. There's one other thing here. You can see the verts. These are the vertices. So if I right click, go to vertex mode. If I do a selection marquee. Just like, all right, so let's do, let's do this vertex point right here. If I do a selection marquee, you can see that I'm currently selecting one vertex point. That's what you want because this is a coherent manifold mesh. It's a nice mesh. It's all good. And when we hit number three, everything seems predictable. Fine. But we can also, uh, because we actually have incoming edges, right? We have like one, two, three, four edges, and they're merging together in this one vertex point. But that's not necessarily the case, because we have four edges, so in theory we, we could have four vertices. So let's do that. Intentionally, we're going to... This is You need to know how to do this to be comfortable when you're modeling. So you need to be able to like merge components together and, and disconnect them. So... This is unnecessary, I think, the way they did this with the interface, because, but whatever. You can find the, it used to be a little uh, easier, but here you can find vertex detach. 
I can also add that to the shelf. This will, when I select this vertex, it's going to detach them. So you see now I have four vertices. Doesn't look like it because they're in the exact same position, mathematically the exact same position still. So it seems like nothing happened. And the, you know, the only way to really tell here is if I do this and I have the poly counter up and I can see, oh, no, there's actually four vertices. But there's a quicker and much more visual way of telling is if we subdivide and you can see, oh, not a predictable nice result because we have unmerged vertices. So that's the only reason I'm showing you how to subdivide pressing three is that when you're modeling, you do this all the time just to make sure that everything is merged. Whenever you see stuff like this, you have to address it. You don't pretend it didn't happen. Right? That will only lead to more problems. <laughs> so then we have to figure out. And sometimes it's uh, the vertices that are not merged. And this can happen for various reasons. But what you do then is you locate the source. So you would, you know, you open up this thing and select the poly counts. You can get this and you figure out, oh, we have four verts here. Fine. So we need to merge them. Edit merge components. So I can add that as well. So we have one to split, we have one to merge. I can merge them back together. And you see the counter says one. If I try to subdivide, we're back to having a nice mesh. Um, sometimes, uh, let me see if this still is the case in Maya, because this is just a bit strange. Uh, so edge detach? No. That's good. Yeah. It can happen sometimes, I think, still in Maya, depending on some tools, that sometimes, even though you have a merged vertex up there and one vertex down here, you can actually have two edges, <laughs> which is ridiculous. But then you would just merge them together. So, uh, yeah, we'll get back to that. It can happen. Okay, so uh, what are we talking about? Yeah, insert edge loop tool. So, all right. So let's do the multi-cut again, so we'll do a try. So if you desperately wanted an edge loop across there, but this one is not allowing it because it's not encountering only quads, it's going to stop there. You can obviously do this, and then, okay, I'm just going to continue manually. I'm going to attach this. Enter. Now we're creating a funky solution up here. Try, try, try. Strange. But, you know, for the sake of demonstration. So there's another way, uh, a tool that's kind of similar to incidental tool, but it's the... Uh, what's it called again? It's like a um, cut faces tool. This is like a lightsaber, so it will just, so you know, it's hard to use it from the perspective view, but we can go to the top view, and then say you wanted an edge loop here, you can start drawing it out, and then if you hold shift, you can get an edge loop that, like that. So that just disregards any topology, you know, just making it happen. Uh, but the good you know, bonus of using the insert edge loop tool is that you'll quickly see if there's something wrong with the mesh. So, because it should work if you only have quads. And if it's not working, there's a reason for it. Right. So unmerged vertices, uh, tries, or n-gons. It could be that you forgot to delete those extra vertices when you deleted an edge. So hitting backspace instead of control backspace. We'll do that. You know, this is all these things that always happen. So don't be afraid. Like when you're in the lab, you're going to be encountering all these problems, but they're it's normal. You just have to, what the hell is going on? And we'll figure it out. Okay. So that's all the whole thing now is you have to get started modeling and getting comfortable modeling. So what you want now is to encounter all these problems and how to address them. So that's the insert edge loop tool. So we're going to talk about one more tool called the extrude, um, which is not the extrude tool. Okay, not the extrude tool, but just the extrude operation. So I'm looking for extrude face. So this again, a little bit strangely named because this will actually work with all the components. 
I'll show you what I mean. So let's look at the extrude. I'm going to add that to the shelf. If I select the face and I hit extrude, I have now extruded, but nothing seems to happen, But because I have to also pull this up. So I can draw, I can like extrude things out and pull them out. If I, so again to exit, just go quickly go to object mode. So when I hit Q, I go to object mode, I'm out of there. So if I subdivide again, that's the shape I get. Okay, uh, but what I was saying is that actually this should work with all the components. So I can extrude uh, edges. I can also even extrude vertices, which I would never do, but you could. Uh, we will be extruding edges a lot, so we'll do that next time. We'll take a look at, uh, sometimes it's actually beneficial to work with planes. So we start out with planes when we model instead of cubes. So that's extrude. Uh, so one thing that you'll probably notice, so you select the face, do an extrude, and you say, no, nothing happens, I'm just going to deselect, and, hmm, strange, let me try again, so extrude, no, nothing happens. So, you know. The thing here is that you're actually, each time I did that, I'm extruding. So now there's a lot of polys here that have no, no, like they're existing, but they're not. <laughs> so uh, the way to tell, and again, I, I, uh, let me let me activate the face centers. So, like I did last time, like selection. I, I want to select faces with center. If I go to face mode, I'll see the face centers. So there, we can see that there are some polys here. You see those face centers? They're not in the center of the polys. I mean, that's one quick way to tell if you just activate the face centers, which I encourage you to do. But so there are polys here that have no right to exist. But if I select this polygon and I go to the move tool, I can just move that out. And I select all these because I extruded twice, right? And now I'm pulling them out. So now it's technically fine. You know, I just pulled them out after the fact. I could do that. And then I could delete everything. And then I could double click. Go to edge mode, right? And double click to select this entire uh, path, edge loop. And then use fill hole, which is somewhere here. Mesh fill hole. That's just a quick way to fill that back. And I can press number three to see if everything works. So just to point out again, there's all these things that can happen. One more, like, OK, so you extrude, nothing happened. You extrude again, so now I just I just did it again. Oh no! So then, if I select these vertices, also you'll see that there are more vertices because there are more polys. There will be more vertices. They're all in the same place. So another way to quickly address this issue is just to grab these and merge them. Now we don't have that problem. Because we merged all the vertices, that in effect will actually merge the polys and they'll disappear. So when I extrude, um, <laughs> this is something you have to do. If you're going to spend more than 15 minutes modeling, this will be worthwhile your time. So go to Settings Preferences, Hotkey Editor. And we're going to go to edit polygons. No, is it? I don't know. Yeah, extrude phase. So edit polygons, extrude phase. I always put this on control E. So you see that's assigned to nothing. You can select your own if you want. But control E is just very nice. Um, yeah, fine. So now I can just go like this and control E or not. It said that it would be take effect next time I started Maya, but this should really work right away. Okay, save. Okay, save. Okay, close. Extrude. All right. 
So then, when you hit extrude, so now I can just control E, um, you'll get the, this icon. So plus and minus, by the way, you can toggle the size of this. I can drag its local Z. That's that's the normal, basically. So I'm the dir the direction. So if you know, let's click here. Then I can rotate this one. And then I can drag it, continue dragging along the direction the poly is facing. So if I'm, if I, let's just rotate it, and then I extrude it again. I can drag it along its direction. That's what this does. But if I wanted to drag it, let's say directly in the z-axis now, according to the world axis, there's this button. So this will change the direction. So if I wanted just to pull it that way, you know, no longer being the local axis. Right? All right. Cool. Go away. Shift I. So, I don't know if we're going to need to do a whole lot of extruding here, but we'll see. This is a very simple one. <clears throat> so, we can imagine, I mean, granted, we might have had some better reference images, but we can imagine that this thing has a little inset, like it's a little cut on the end to make it slide in here. So that's what I'm going to try to do. So thinking about it, you know, logically you think that, okay, so then we're going to start cutting into this. Okay. That's actually a little bit trickier than thinking could be rather extrude out. So I'm making a very general thing here, but whenever you have like Think about it, if you can rather extrude out. So if I, okay, so let me insert a couple of edge loops. So I'm back in the insert edge loop tool. I want to access the tool settings for this tool. There's this button, which will activate the tool settings. And it comes over here. So what we've been doing so far with the insert edge loop tool is just going like this, I can just place one where I leave it. But I can also do multiple edge loops. So I could do two. I can also do one, like multiple one. That makes no sense, but that will actually place one in the center. So it's very efficient. So remember I can also scale, so I can scale these apart. So I'm, you know, scale them apart like this. So instead of thinking that I now have to carve these in, I'd rather extrude this out. Does that make sense? It's just, it's a little bit more elegant, right? So there we have it. <coughs> okay, it's, it's hard, uh, I think when you start modeling, you'll find yourself a little lost because oftentimes you have to try a couple of times to see the simple solution, like the most elegant solution and there are there's no right or wrong you know you feel free sometimes this takes time but when you model more and more you'll get more used to finding the simple solutions so I'm just gonna drag these verts back it's gonna grab all of those you know more or less put them in here so even though I already did this extrude you know, I could still grab these verts. I could even, you know, grab all these and scale them towards each other. So like we were saying, I think last time, that often it's the vertices that you should think about altering. Okay, so we did that. Let's just put a back leg in there. So I'm just going to revert back to this one before I did any beveling. I'm just going to copy that over here. See if I can just quickly create a leg. So I'm just going to grab the birds. And we'll just guesstimate this. You know, So this one is a little bit more curved. So I'm going to show you uh, just using the insert edge loop tool. We could do some simple things. Just inserting a few edge loops. You know, only with these we could start introducing some curvature. You don't need a whole lot of polys, oftentimes, to do shapes. Uh, let me go to the side view. 
right? So if you wanted to establish a curvature here, you can grab the verts. You know, very simple, but works. And I could have introduced more edge loops if I wanted to be more precise, but that's fine for now. So maybe you know we can narrow it down. So you can spend time with this, making it the the way you want. But you see, just by doing these simple things, we're altering the contours enough. Arguably, All right, so me maybe do a little extrude up here. I don't know, something, something. And let's bevel. So with this time, with this one, we're gonna have to bevel. I'm gonna freeze the transformations. This one is worthwhile beveling select edges because if I just bevel in object mode for this guy, it's also gonna bevel these internal edges, which is not really necessary. So, you know, it's also gonna bevel these. So instead of doing that, let me copy this. I'm gonna select the edges I wanna bevel. So that's all the contour edges, right? The actual corners. So I can go and, you know, select, shift, and keep selecting like this. Not very efficient. Let me show you another uh, hotkey, by the way. So, yes, you have to go in here and find it and set it up, but usually it will follow your user. I mean, it should. <laughs> uh, that's all I can say. So, so polygon select. Um, select uh, edge loop. So not the select edge loop tool, uh, but just select edge loop, the operation to select edge loop. I'm gonna put that on control L. That's what I do. See, it's assigned to nothing and makes sense. So, yes, assign, uh, okay. It's just a little bit quicker because instead of having to double click each time you wanna select an edge loop, I can single click. It seems like it's such a stupid little thing. Why would you bother? But so let's isolate this because I can just go like that. So if I wanted to select all these edge loops, I can just single marquee select control L and I have all those edge loops. So this makes a difference like when you're modeling a lot. So instead of having to double click shift double click, let's say I had hundreds of these, it could happen. So then I would go like that and control L select the edge loop. So those are the ones I don't want to bevel, right? But then I can hold shift and I can invert that selection. So sometimes you select the ones you don't want if it's easier and then you invert the selection. And bevel. And same thing. So we can just go into the operation. So control A will eventually take me to the channel box. So I can go to the fraction, so 0 0.1 or whatever value you want. And that's it. Maybe it's not thick enough. Let me just quickly do it in object mode for this. Whatever. Now it's too thick. Maybe it's the my little seat here that's actually not optimal. So I can alter that using the vertices, scaling the vertices. So, uh, you know, I'm still making a lot of decisions for the shape of this, so I'm not beveling it yet. There's no need to bevel until you're really pleased with the shapes. Okay, cool. So let's just get those, uh, these ones and we're, we're done. Um, quickly, running out of time. Um, yeah. So, uh, for these, I'm just going to add some edge loops. So, one really good uh, practice is to always make sure you have a dividing line. Oh, we have to talk about this. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're not going to go over. Uh, okay, we have three minutes. All right. This is important. 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 Ah, crap. So, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to finish this one. You know, it would just be repetitive. But let's talk about uh, mirror geometry. So one uh, very uh, nice uh, thing to do is to have a dividing line. Whenever you're making symmetrical objects, you make sure you have a dividing uh, edge loop that's in the middle of the grid. 
So I'm going to make this just by going to the insert edge loop tool and multiple edge loops of one. So there we go. That means I can make changes to this side, not necessarily having to worry all the time about the other side. So then I can delete half of it and do a mirror operation. So this is something we do all the time. Uh, you know, there are differences uh, in, well, different preferences. So, you know, some people like to set up like proxy copies, and we can look at that next time. Right now there's no time. Uh, but for me personally, I don't do that. So typically I would just, you know, I would make changes to it. And when you're working though, like if I'm, if I'm doing edge loops, if I need to do an edge loop and I need to do this and I need to do something here, whatever, you see, I need, I need to have the whole model. I need both sides for the edge loops and everything just to work properly. But I'm just making the changes to one of the sides. You know, that, that's how I like to do it. And then, you know, let's say this is looking funky, but this is the change you wanted. Okay, so then just delete this. And now we're going to do mirror, mirror geometry. So a good, good thing is just to get rid of the history, make sure you delete uh, your freeze your transformations, make sure this is clean, and then we're going to do mirror geometry. So mesh mirror geometry, if you go to the options for it, these are all the axes. So X, Y, Z. We're going to be mirroring, if we take a look at the axis indicator, we're going to be mirroring with the x-axis. So in the direction of the x, that's plus x. So, okay, cool. So then it mirrors. One thing we have to be careful with, so I'm just going to show you this, uh, just as an example. So I don't need these edge loops, but I'm uh, deliberately just placing these edge loops very close together. Uh, so whatever, so we're going to do a mirror. What will often happen is, okay, didn't happen. I think it's because our scene is so huge. But let, let, you know, sometimes you have to be aware because you have edge loops that are really close together. Okay, so we're going to be doing a mirror. So see there it did it. So it actually merged these ones together in one vertex point. And I don't want that because it creates a huge try right here and on the other side. I just want those two edge loops to flow across as before without being merged together in one point. And that's the merged threshold. So that's the important setting when you do uh, mirror geometry. You go into the operation, you find merge threshold. This is the radius sort of or diameter in which the vertices will be merged. So the greater this number, you know, eventually, let's just try, it will be, you know, one point. It's like expanding the merge. So we want a very small number though, so 0 0.1, so even 0 0.1 in this case doesn't cut it because it merges these ones. So it's going to do 0 0.01 and that's fine. Then though, you have to really make sure that all these vertices are aligned. If you have a very small merge threshold, if some of these vertices are not exactly on the center line, chances are they won't be merged. So let's try it. Uh, mirror geometry. I'm just going to go in here. And, uh, see, it's not going to be merged, obviously, because they're not close enough together, and our merge threshold is set low. So when you mirror, be considerate about the merge threshold, but also be make sure that all your vertices along the dividing line is exactly correct. So let's let me just intentionally mess this up. I need all these vertices to be on x0. There is a feature here, which for some reason is hidden, but it's here. You go to the move tool, and we can enter a value of 0 for x in move tool, having all these vertices selected. Now they're at x0. That usually works. Not always. So if it doesn't work, uh, there's another thing you can do. Select all of them. I can scale them towards each other. Now using the middle mouse button because that axis is active. Just scale and scale and scale and scale towards each other to align them. And then I can move them around. But obviously I want to hold X and snap. Now I can be pretty sure those are aligned, right? So then fine, now we can mirror again. Whoops, wrong tool. So that's the mirror geometry. So that, that was the last crucial little tool I really wanted to show you.
And again, we would have to bevel this, and it would be the case of making uh, select edges, so it might be quicker to select the edge loops that you, in this case, do not want to merge. So maybe all these, and holding Control shift to add to the selection without removing from the selection, and Control l to select all the edge loops, and then I can shift selection marquee to invert that selection, and I will do the bevel. Right? And I got some extra ones that I should also have uh, deselected. Whatever. You get the point. 0 0.1. All right. All right. Any questions? <laughs> so what a beautiful chair. All right. Uh, so that's what I want you to do. Uh, essentially, uh, also, you can look for components in the chair that you can try to make into a table. So instead of making the table from scratch, Try to see if you can use some components that you make in the chair and convert it into a table. That's sort of the mindset of reusing elements, having sort of a modular approach, which we did not have time to talk about at all, which we'll talk about later. So for the assignment, uh, you know, I, I'm actually happy if you have a technically correct chair and a table. Then I'm happy, right? Um, so if you want to take it further and make the whole kitchen set, you can, but I'll be happy for the assignment. Uh, if you have a t table and a chair like this, keep it simple, be exploring the tools, but you have to uh, also make use of the extrude and, you know, that all, all this stuff. All right. Okay. All right. Any questions before we go? All right. Thank you.